Yo guys, welcome back to the Blue Podcast with me, Tom and Ben. How you doing, mate? I'm good, thanks. And today we got a special guest of Fuad from the 360. Oh, I've just forgotten the name of it now. I'm sorry. 360 TV. All good. 360 all TV. Good. There you go. <laughs> How you doing? All good, bro. How you doing? Thanks for having me on, man. No worries, no worries. Uh, before we get into the podcast, do you want to let uh, our viewers know what exactly it is you do on the uh, over there? Um, well, basically, well, we're trying to kind of make a media company over there. Well, I mean, we've had our Instagram page going as like our main kind of blog page, which is kind of our kind of news outlet, if you want to call it. And more recently, over the last kind of two years, we've started trying to create our own original content. So we started our YouTube out and our podcast, Stoppage Time TV, which we've had going for the last two years of me, Cam and Mayowa. It's kind of picked up pace over the last year or so, obviously, kind of with COVID and everything, we kind of took the momentum really and truly. So it's been real fun kind of growing it, kind of just trying to give um, sports media a new and a different alternative perspective and an outlook, to be honest. So we feel like if we can kind of make any headways or chip into that, we'll contribute where we can. Oh, that's uh, sounds pretty cool. Definitely uh, something that's... Uh, I've, I've had a look at your channel. It's very new and interesting definitely so I'll, I'll leave a link for it down below so make sure everyone that's watching this podcast, sure. go check it out uh this will be out on thursday 4 p.m so remember we all i think we've got a podcast out on sunday and then it's our christmas special for our viewers who are watching so uh, make sure you check out the one on the weekend and the one coming out christmas eve it's the i think they're both two very very good podcasts so uh, hopefully you guys enjoy them obviously check out our merch i'm not wearing it as per usual need as ben but you're, you're, assuming, you're assuming we have viewers, you know. <laughs> maybe, maybe not a few for this one, maybe. Trust me, uh, you never know who's watching. Even when we started out, I think when we dropped our first video, Rio Ferdinand had commented and kind of seen our stuff and followed our page, and it was like, hold on, what was going on here? So trust me, <laughs> don't be surprised. You never know who's watching. That's all I'll tell you. Don't Fair focus enough. on numbers. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> Uh, we've, we've had a few we've had a few decent videos in the past we've had a few decent videos <laughs> uh but before we get to all the, all the podcast stuff just the maintenance stuff spotify in the link description below twitter at the blue podcast one and instagram at the blue podcast one well this has been recorded on tuesday and uh on amazon prime today chelsea played Wolves and city played mm. west brom and let's be honest me and ben have not got smiles on our faces <laughs> uh first game Chelsea lost 2-1 to Wolves. I watched that game uh, disheartingly. I had my dinner in front of it with a beer. And I was pretty happy. I was, I was pretty happy for about 60 minutes. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> First half, we were just about the better team. Neither team could take, take control. Giroud and Zuma, any other day, they're winning 2-0 when he goes into half-time. Zuma. Did anyone see the Zuma jump before half-time? No. People are saying it was like a Ronaldo leap. It was huge. I don't know how the guy gets so high. (laughs) Do you know what it is? Is I think a lot of people have kind of said this season they've seen a massive jump in him. And I think it's the concentration. Like, I think he's harnessing his athleticism this year more than ever. I Mm -hmm. think with previous years, he's kind of been more erratic and a bit more too quick for his own body, too strong for his own good. Like, But I feel like this year he's finally getting the pieces together. But, I mean, for that second goal, when... (laughs) jockeying for kind of 30 yards there that was yeah. kind of like almost what you thought oh is this kind of the same old zuma is yeah. it, he's still got a bit of that in him but massive improvements this season but tough yeah, it's, game, it's, it's it's playing next to Thiago Silva that must just put confidence on any pretty much any center back in the Premier League if you play next to the the class of Thiago Silva he's played with with the greats over the years you you must feel confident. It's just, it's like I've said this before on the podcast, back when he played with Terry, when he first coming through, when you're playing next to Terry, he looked brilliant. Obviously, he had that just horrific injury where he, I was at that game and he, uh, a whole crowd just goes, oh, as his knee just bends inwards. It was horrific. Yeah. But yeah. It's, it's, it's nice to see him back at his best and four goals this season, the highest, more, it's the most goals he's scored in the season ever already. Which is, is a it good four start. or six? I think he might have more. Uh, Premier League, four Premier League. Ah, okay, yeah. yeah. So, uh, four but, I Premier mean, League you, you reckon he could hit double figures? Mate, it'd be, it'd be something if he does. <laughs> I wouldn't, I wouldn't be too surprised, you know. Nowadays, you got guys like Sergio Ramos and all sorts, and yeah. if he can hammer a penalty or two in, who knows if Jorginho's willing to give that up? But <laughs> zoom <or> penalties, <laughs> that'd be that'd be quite interesting. <laughs> Take <Rose> them off <laughs> further. 
Um, but yeah, the the second the second goal for, for Wolves was. Uh, I mean, he, he's in that. that he's on what's one on one. What do you do? Do you do you take the foul? Do you risk an open goal? For me, it's a case of when you got that kind of numbers back, especially you kind of. I feel like as the first man, you should commit. Okay. I feel like as the first man, and even if it's not commit, it's shield them out wide or just kind of safeguard them into where you've kind of got runners and men behind you. Yeah. I felt like he just kind of almost gave him the best option, which was to just shimmy and kind of watch him along the box. And Pedronetto went, oh, you think I'm going right, left? Here you go, left foot hammer. And yeah. honestly, what a finish. you got to give Fantastic Neto credit finish. where it's due. The, the, even the dribbling to kind of create that kind of chance to drag the ball up the pitch. That was a quick counter right Because it went from Chelsea almost going all guns yeah. blazing at one end. Yeah. And then to quickly switch into the other end. So, yeah. I mean, Zuma, I think personally he'll take the flack for that. But listen, I think defensively, I think Chelsea got caught out a little bit sleeping there. Yeah. I mean, it was right, right at the end of the game. Kind of, yeah, just got, got, got caught napping really. Uh Fantastic finish. I don't really like Neto because he tried to dive beforehand and uh, Cheeky sort of trying to get a penalty. And then, and then was complaining about it afterwards. Oh, I mean, oh, oh it's coming out now. <laughs> uh, have, you not, have you not seen the dive, Ben? Uh, no, I didn't watch it. I didn't watch oh, it. man. He doesn't get touched at all. VAR check, slow motion, fast motion, no touch from Reese James at all. Um, he's complaining afterwards that he got touched. And it's, yeah. it's, I, don't, I don't get it when the players are like, Complaining. Do you know what it is? It's 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 grown athletes at this point, and I feel like football's almost becoming a non-contact sport. Yeah. I mean, the other week in the Champions League, we saw Greenwood get a penalty for a 50-50 barge. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. when was the last time you saw two players getting into a 50-50 barge and them kind of tussling it out? It Never do you see that. With, uh, it happened with um, Ronaldo, uh, Cristiano Ronaldo against uh, Barca. He got he got shoulder barge and, and uh, got a penalty and, for it. And that's the thing. It's now the players are looking for the advantage. So the player who's being barred is thinking, I'm going to go down because this is an easy foul for me. Even mm-hmm. defenders, when they're kind of last man in the area and an attacker comes to put pressure on them, slightest touch, they yeah. go down like a shot. And it's like, <laughs> it, it's embarrassing. You're like, you're a yeah. six foot two, 90 kilo. <laughs> and you're going down like this. It, honestly, like at, at this point right now, football's getting embarrassing the way it's going yeah. so, uh, with some of these diving. Yeah, yeah. We've definitely. had uh, we've had my dad, Ben's dad, my granddad, and my uncle come on the podcast, and I think almost every time we've talked about just how the difference in physicality between back when they started watching and now mm-hmm. it's just it's almost a joke. Do you know what the craziest thing is? Is I see guys like Graham Sooner sitting up there critiquing and criticizing, oh. and saying that's a red card, and I'm like, have you seen your highlight reel? <laughs> It's pretty much a chop fest where he's just going in and hammering anything and everything and then says, ref, I've got the ball. Like, no, no. I don't know what gave you a play, but it wasn't football. But for me, I feel like, especially over the last kind of maybe decade or so, because maybe Pep and Spain's team have kind of led this tika taka, let's focus on philosophies and playing out the back. The technical side of the game is definitely more appreciated now more than it ever was. And I think we've got more technical players in the game than ever. Mm. But I feel like that's almost come at a cost of the defensive and the physical side of the game, where now those physicality was a big part of defending back in the day. Rattling your man in the first five minutes was getting into his head and letting him know, I'm there early on type of thing. But now it's like no physicality allowed. Defending is almost like, you're you, you're you're more praised if you're good on the ball than you are at being an actual defender. Because if you're an actual defender, people see you as almost ah oh, he's limited. He can't play out the back. And it's like no, that's his primary job. That's what he should be doing. <laughs> it's, to it's, like, <laughs> it's to stop goals. It's like when people say oh, like I understand now, fullbacks and defenders are wanted more. But for me, the primary job is always to remember defending is your first focus. And I feel like now in football that is so not the main focus. It's almost like, let's play out the back. Let's create something. Mm. Let's be um, positive, as they always say. And it's like, it's not positive. It, it, I look at it from like being a Spurs fan. Jose, the football he plays, I never complain because I just think it gets results. That's mm. what you want at the end of the day is results. You don't care about anything. So for me, the physicality and defending side of the game, goodbye. That, and we're not going to see that return, by the way. No. With, with VAR and all that now, I don't know what you guys think, but that is that is definitely not coming back. I don't think. I mean, I I can't stand VAR. Um, 
He's a City fan, so understandably, I've everything been, yeah, goes I've against him. I've been particularly, <laughs> particularly hard done by by VAR. But, um, yeah, I, I think, I, I guess that sort of uh, links to, like, these top six matches. There's no passion in them either anymore. And I guess, I know there's part of that's the fans, but part of it, I, even before, when the fans were still there, like, back in the day, uh, United mm-hmm. Arsenal, that was, like, fiery as you want. And now... Yeah. Those rivalries are just not, not the same. Mm. I mean, we've spoken about the podcast. Pretty much the last big rivalry game was the Battle of the Bridge, Chelsea Spurs, when we uh, stopped you from getting the title. Sorry for bringing that up. I just had to. Yeah. <laughs> Bad day um, in history for us. <laughs> but uh, yeah, on the uh, the physicality going, and you said how back in the day defenders would put a really hard challenge on, on the striker just to say that they're there. I remember watching the, the podcast that. Uh, Lineker, Shearer, and Wright did over lockdown. Mm. And they always would mention how they'd get from from the best defenders they ever played against. They're always that just that little big tackle just at the start of the game. And that's when you know that it's the best yeah. defender. Well they, they were they were they were experts in the dark arts. It's like a little little woman yeah. you're in a uh, little pinch, you know, in the back, exactly. you know, little knee in, in the back. Just just little things to try and get in your head and stuff. And you hit the nail on the head there, the dark arts. That's what yeah, it was. Yeah. With VAR now, you've got CCTV there. You do any <laughs> slight dig or any kind of shirt pulling, the, it, it doesn't. You're, you're gone. Mm. That's it. And I feel like that kind of enthusiasm and passionate side of the game where you saw two players battle. And let's not get it twisted. For me, I always felt like that aggressive side of defending, when a, it, it made the attackers better as well. Because mm. now he had to think about, this guy's going to keep digging me and I know he's going to dive in. So why don't I just cutely flick it around him? And it made them better plays. And you were like, oh, my God, I've been seeing this guy get chopped for the last 60 minutes, and now he's just popped up. Like mm-hmm. when, when Dennis Burkamp did that little flick, oh, you probably it. knew Dabizaz all game was gripping onto him. And not, he said, all right, I'll give you some. Flick, here you go. One of the greatest <laughs> Premier League goals ever. And that's, for me, like the physicality. When you lose that, it's not just defenders who's in. It's attackers who's in and the entertainment side, the competitive side. That, for me, is the most important thing. Let's not forget, football is a sport. It's competitive. Let's not lose the edge, the passion, because then you lose the competition and it just becomes this, what we see in nowadays, where it's just kind of these dull affairs and you see big names and lights. But when was the last top six flight we saw that was, this was a game worth watching? A lot of the games I enjoy are kind of mid-table, mid, uh, kind of Premier League kind of scraps against the big sides or whatever. Mm. Yeah, so it's often like the, the smaller team against the big six side, you like do an upset or something. That's, that's, that's the entertaining game. Yeah, literally. Right. But well, what, what do you guys think on just um, kind of how the entertainment value has dropped over recent years? Do you guys think the Premier League is as entertaining as it used to be? Because this was kind of a discussion we was having on our podcast kind of recently, and we just feel like over the last few years, it's just become very more system-based and tacticals mm. and philosophies and that's kind of taken the um x factor out of players it's just made them system players almost yeah. as a right back you're just meant to go up and down right now there's no more inverted runs there's no more it's it's weird but what do you guys think um i mean i i completely agree with that that the entertainment value has gone down and it's part of this um var is a part of it is this sort of trying to make something that's it's taking the humanity out of something. It's trying to make it too scientific. It's like, right, so this, this, this is, we've got VAR now, so we'll know for definite this is it. But then they're not, like, the referee on the pitch, he, he, he's got the feeling of the game. He, under, he understands what's going on in the game, but they're taking that humanity out of it. So then you have all these dodgy decisions through, through VAR. And then you have, like you say, you have these tactic systems. Then I mean, a positive of the science is obviously like sports science and all that nutrition, blah, blah, blah. That's good. But then when you're saying like they're getting too sort of like caught up in like tactical approach and all that, it's just, just, it's a sport. Like you say, it's competitive. You, you, you're not playing to play a system. You're playing to win. You're not playing for a certain tactic. You're playing to win. It, yeah. hundred percent. It's not. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I mean, I guess from uh, our standpoint as people who try to analyze the game, having this, kind of philosophy way is something we can analyse better. But in terms of just a a fan watching the game, you want those hard challenges. You want players shoving each other a little bit more. And 
it has died off, I would say, over the last, I'd say, 10 years. Yeah. It's, obviously, years 10 years. it's obviously within reason. So, like yeah. you said, you, you have, like, Graham Sunez being like, oh, it's a red, and he's, like, two foot into one's chest. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> then you have, like someone who's like just touching their air and they're going down. You need somewhere in between. Yeah, hundred percent of balance. Yeah, for sure. It just, and, uh, I mean, seems to come, they've gone from there and then gone the other way. So it's no, yeah, yeah. If uh, I, I come from quite a rugby background, and when rugby introduced uh, well VAR to it, it didn't change the game. Nothing changed fundamentally to the game, whereas you brought it into football, and there's argument after argument after decision that's wrong, decision that's right, and you, there's, there's no, no one's winning currently with VAR, and it's it, football's yeah. already already getting to that point where if you got touched in the box, likely it is they're going down, and that's then enough. that's what made, but that's what brought in VAR because it's so difficult for a ref. Moving at that speed to to catch if actually the person did get nicked, yeah, and yeah. that's that's what's kind of happened with this whole change of. It's philosophy. created for me. It, there's so many variables within football as well that can happen, and how players can manipulate the rules differently compared to like a sport like rugby. I'll be honest with you. I feel like mm. players are, are are kind of more more aware to this and kind of I I don't know play kind of pull the rules a little bit. But I feel like one thing VAR has done, for example linesmen now are redundant mm. yeah. i don't know why every game there's two guys with flags out there just waving them around they're redundant because really and truly every offside decision every goal gets looked at through this little diagonal line or whatever and most of the times they tell the linesman don't put your flag up anyway let the goal go in and var will review <laughs> yeah. it. so it's like what are you out there waving a flag for really and truly yeah. and what it's also done for me it's made referees more lazy it, essentially now you can Every decision to take two, three minutes out of the game, which kills the game at the tempo, go and take your time, go and double check with the man in the box. And it's like, no, no, do you know what? I'll go and check the camera. It's like, why don't you just go check the camera first time round? Boom, let's get this sorted. Like that, this is meant to kind of finalize and quicken decisions and just let us move the game on. And instead, it's just made a whole nother episode and drama of football. And you just feel like you, we want the game to get better, not get worse. And you guys are just making the game of football more and more difficult and it's just like I don't, I don't know where it stops to be honest yeah I mean that's another thing that is what making the entertainment value worse is yeah because like goal goes and you're like right right see if it gets chalked off oh, yeah, how then, many yeah. times how many t- I'm sure you lot uh, like have you tweeted goal or something and then it's like two minutes later you're like oh fuck yeah VAR I gotta delete that yeah. <laughs> it's like yeah. what is the, what is the point you can't even players can't even celebrate yeah. Like when was the last time we saw a good, good celebration? Yeah, I but, remember every match of the day you see top tier celebrations. You see, coming <laughs> out. now it's like players are like, "What, what, what?" Has he given it? Yeah. Oh, I've got to check with him in the boxes. <laughs> it just kills everything. So I'm just like, I don't yeah. know, man. Well, I, I don't think because you know, in those like top six big games, you can you can remember like important goals going, and the camera's shaking. Because yeah. like the fans are celebrating so much and the celebration is so passionate, but I don't even like even if it's an important game and it's an important goal, I don't think you'll have a, celebrations that are as passionate as that anymore. Just because do you of think? Yeah. Do you guys think the? Sorry if I'm going a bit off topic here yeah, as well, but the perfect. fans kind of the fans uh, missing over the last years. How big of an impact do you think that's had? We've uh, we've had a a lot of chats actually about. The different impacts it's had. So one one of our guests said that basically it's it's like how uh, who's the uh, Ollie Watkins and Bamford. It's like how they're scoring goals right now because there's no pressure from fans. The different playing in the Premier League with no fans is different to playing in the Premier League with loads of fans, loads of pressure. That's allowing these strikers just there's no pressure when they're having a shot. They can take a shot and there's no outrage yeah. for them doing that and it just makes it so much easier for them to feel confident in themselves yeah. and the same with the I defenders mean, I've been said yeah. before then yeah yeah I mean I I, I get that but I mean I, if I was to the other side of that is which is what what where I, I what I believe is that having no fans there has made so you've you earlier on in the season you had these crazy score lines like 7-2 against Liverpool you know like 6-1 United Spurs yeah, Spurs yeah. Like, 
in like in, in in my opinion, it's because with the no fans being there, the intensity has dropped. The that that sort of drive has dropped. So then, but like, so when a defender's defending, they're less inclined to do that that extra half yard. Yeah. When an attacker's attacking, it's less likely to make that little darting run. Like, I think it's just a complete drop in sort of. It's 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 that concentration as well that it gives yeah. you. Like when you know that your mistake is gonna get bollocked by 40, <laughs> 30, 000 yeah. people all going, ooh, it's like. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know what? I better stay on my P's and Q's. But right now, it's like defenders are just a bit lax. All you can hear is rah, 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 in the background as we do on TV. And it's like, all right, this is a training ground session. Let's kind of, it's kind of got that feel and vibe to it. And some teams I feel like have benefited from it and players have benefited from it. As you say, it's like, it's less pressure. You're kind of, but I think uh, it's the same for the other foot. Some players have kind of, lost out on it because mm. I think a lot of defenders are just kind of just a bit more relaxed and just thinking, eh. but it's like, you're conceding six and seven goals every week. Like Fulham up until about two weeks ago, were looking hard. And it was like, these kind of things, like you look at Sheffield, the difference, Rocking like difference. this season, rock bottom since Corona lockdown has happened and their fans haven't been there. They've been arguably the worst side. They've been worse than Derby's Paul Jewell almost. Yes. Yeah, so it's like, style, you see style. for certain clubs, I feel like it just impacts them more. Burnley as well, I can think of. Their fan base is so important to them. And you just think, do you know what? Having that extra man sometimes can make the difference. And it makes games like, I think even Spurs' game against Palace on the weekend. Had the Palace fans been there, I reckon we would have lost that. Because second half, we were just getting battered and battered and battered. And we just had no real answer to them. And their goalkeeper was playing Superman. Their fans would have been rocking and said, hold on, we're going to get something. And we would have just crumbled. And everyone would have been like, oh, vintage Spursy. But because there's no fans, were able to then be like, do you know what? We can regroup. And so there's goods and bads to it, I feel like. But definitely for me, there's more negatives than good. Yeah. I just feel like, I just feel like fans are the life kind of of the game. Without fans, there really is no game. Do you, do you feel like with, with Spurs and the way that Mourinho is playing, it's almost actually beneficial on away games for Spurs 100%. to not have fans? 100%. Like, I'm telling you now, had we had fans, there would have been so much more criticism of Jose from Spurs fans because they would have been like, you would have heard a lot more booing when we're drawing or losing and we're playing this negative football or whatever. Yeah. Not thinking, do you know what? He's just trying to nick a goal here and just trying to see out the result. And Or we've got the 2-0 and he just, second half is not interested in attacking. Fans would have been booing that. When he did that against Arsenal, second half, no shots on target. Chelsea second half no shots on target and he's just like you know I've got the result I wanted fans would have been nah I paid money to come watch something but for me personally I feel like our club that's this is what we need Spurs are not a club of um, great history Chelsea for example the last 15 years you've been lapping it up silverware you've been drinking out of Champions Leagues Premier Leagues Man City likewise You've been drinking in silverware. <laughs> I'm starving out here, bro. I'm starving. I just want a breadcrumb of silverware. <laughs> in 20 odd years of being a Spurs fan, I've had a league cup. And yeah. even that, it's, it means nothing in the grand scheme of things. You know what I mean? So it's like, Jose, for me, I feel like he's trying to instill a mentality of every point matters. Every game matters. It's not always about style and football and aesthetics I feel like you can focus on that once you've built that culture of winning once you've had a Premier League a, a Europa League or however many cups to satisfy your appetite you can say you know what let's add the champagne to this let's add the icing on the cake let's add the cherry on top but till you've actually won something win first and for me that's what I feel like having been a frustrated starved Spurs fan that's what I want to see I don't care about 15 years they've always seen us oh they're going to challenge one of these days they play such good football they're positive they develop youngsters bore off I just want to win now I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm tired of being the bridesmaid and one day you're going to get married I want my <laughs> wedding day give it to me <laughs> and Jose's bringing that I'll tell you I always say on our like selfish like, I call it the Jose wait this is what he's developing, this mentality that he's developed at every single club where it's a siege mentality. We're not going to be the yeah. nice guys. You guys saw it in the documentary. He's like, yeah. let's be bastards. Let's be nasty guys. And you love that. You, every Jose team you can think of, you're like, they're the villains of this league. I want to see my team become the villains for once. So when yeah. I'm seeing us fighting teams and scrapping for points and 
dirty tackles flying, and I'm like, I'm seeing and Dom pressing more than ever. He's done a full circle under this kind of Jose oh, way. Nice, so nice. You, you, you think kind of, for me, he's brought a lot of positives that I feel like this club was lacking before. And that's not to criticise or take away anything Pochettino's done. I love that man and everything he's done for this club. But Jose is another beast. Jose is another level. Jose is everything Spurs want to be. That is what Jose has achieved. Mm-hmm. So for me, the, we're, we're not in a position where, oh, we can complain that Jose's playing ugly football. No, this man's seen it all and done it all. We should be grateful that he's here, in all honesty. After we lost the Champions League final, we had a, one of our worst starts to a league season ever. We had a mishmash squad of that had gone stale, basically, and not been freshened up over five years. And now, all of a sudden, we're league titles after a summer of splurging from Daniel Levy. This is absurd. <laughs> you, you, like I don't think he would have even done that kind of splurging had Jose not been in charge. Mm. I feel like that's the kind of manager where he's like, I can hedge my bets and back this man. So... Yeah. If we're going to see that side come out of Levy as well, and it not only improves the playing staff, the club as a whole, and the chairman, bro, this is a powerful manager. Well, let, let, let's not let's not criticise his playing style. Let's focus on the bigger picture. And I feel yeah. like that's what Jose is doing. Yeah. yeah, I think he'll definitely, definitely at least get you an FA Cup. At least. At least. Uh, I've said, yeah, yeah, like this year, I think we're, we're, we're getting silverware, in all honesty. I think some, for, whether it be Europa League, FA Cup, or League Cup, Jose doesn't, rest players in cup games he doesn't like once it gets to the crunch times it, there's no oh I'm playing my B team no it's no all guns blazing yeah, yeah they, he doesn't do they, any of that and, and I felt like previously under Pochettino that was our problem Poch would play the youth team and the B team in the FA Cup and we'd get dumped out until we got to a semi-final and by then the pressure is on all the players who haven't played and it's like deliver us this moment and they can't handle it typical they, people would say Spursy but it's like, Jose, I feel like, is developing this mentality of, do you know what? Let's just first team effort every game, no matter what the result is, I want 100%. That's why even when we won, when we drew against Palace, he wasn't happy with that. Even when we drew against Chelsea, he was coming out and saying, like, the squad aren't happy with that. And I, that's what I want for my team. And that's mm-hmm. what we want to see from Spurs. It's like a mentality change, a big, big mentality change. And I think Jose brings that more than ever. Yeah, it's definitely instilled that sort of um, the players have got a, a, that determination now. Um, mm-hmm. Like, I mean, you had you had that under Poch for a time, but at the, I mean, like you say, at the start of last season, and and even the end of the season before that, to an extent, it it just seemed to be. This, it just seemed to all unravel. Yeah, they, mm-hmm. like they, they had no direction. I think that's what Ho, Jose has given them. And the thing is, is I, I felt I felt sorry for Poch as well because I always felt like he got the most out of a team that I don't think many other managers could have. And mm. what he achieved with that team was incredible. But I don't think he was backed enough. And I think yeah, maybe a year to two years, that was his biggest frustration. He, he almost looked pissed off in his last season because he was just like, All right, I'm not getting back, so let me just throw my toys out of the pram type thing. And mm. you felt that kind of almost move on to the players and they just kind of almost seemed a bit kind of misdirected as you mm-hmm. said so it was it was for me an interesting time and and am, am I kind of grateful that Mourinho's come in and replaced him by all means yes am I grateful for what Poch did yeah but that doesn't kind of just because you praise one man doesn't mean you have to kind of shit on another if that makes sense yeah. like two things can coexist but Tom as a Chelsea man what did you think when he left um Chelsea under that kind of circumstance uh, where 10th think players have gone against him same thing happens again at United when you saw him leave United and take the Tottenham job did you think this now what's happening is going to happen or did you think now nah, this man's a washed up dinosaur this is a finished club and they're both going to crash and burn together type of thing I mean, obviously, you know, I was pissed off. <laughs> Enjoyed Spurs just after yeah. United. I mean, <laughs> I've spoken about it on the podcast before. I was not, me and my dad is also a big Chelsea fan, but we were just not happy, not happy people. Uh, I remember the interview with uh, Mourinho, and he was asked, Would you ever join Spurs? And he said, No, I'm a Chelsea fan. Mm-hmm. And then he was United and Spurs, probably our most yeah. two hated clubs as a Chelsea. Biggest rivalries, yeah. But, um, uh, I think we all knew deep down he was going to do a job. Mm. The uh, I had hope. I know this is a, a 
kind of mean thing to say. I had hope at the end of last season you weren't brilliant. <laughs> so I had hope that you wouldn't be very good. Obviously, Spurs and Mourinho combining, it was like, oh, don't please don't do well. But yeah. this, this season, you've, I mean, he's pulled out the bag. He's got players playing for him more than anything. And yeah. I, w- I was going to ask you before like, about the, the backing for Poch. Mourinho's had backing. He's brought in depth. That's uh, one of the main things when I was uh, looking at the teams for the Chelsea Spurs game. I looked at your bench and I was like, crap, they could bring on some players who could just do some yeah. damage in the last 20, 30 minutes. And yeah. that's, that's the difference between the Poch side and the, the Mourinho side. On Dombele, this season, completely a different player from last season. Dyer at the back, he's actually been that, that aggressive, hard-hitting centre-back that the Premier League wants. And as someone as someone who was one of his biggest critics as well, I've got to credit him for his improvements because guys like him and Aurier as well, yeah, I, I, I couldn't wait to get rid of them last year. I had so many times lost my mind at how many times they'd cost us. And I said, I'm done with these guys. But this season, and for me, this is what it is about Jose. This defines coaching for me. Improving players who we think are, as general fans, are all, all over. We all thought, Aurier and Dyer are not the levels. But a manager that can take that kind of media player and convince him, no, follow my instructions and I'll show you how you can actually get the best out of yourself. That's what true coaching is all about. And I feel like that's what Jose is showing us time and time again. And I hated it when people were doubting him after he got sacked at United. Because I felt like it was an incorrect sack. I felt like they chose the young batch of players over an experienced manager who'd seen it all and done it all. Mm. And it was like... Now look at United, they're not really any better off for it. Meanwhile, yeah. Jose is here, here proving exactly what he said at United. So I'm um, just looking at this. <laughs> yeah, go on. I loved his, uh, his comment where he said, his, what was your greatest achievement? Getting second in Manchester United. Mm. Because that, that team... squad was that bad. Yeah. <laughs> Literally, it was that bad. It, like People think he was joking and it's like, you saw how quickly they fell off afterwards and he kept saying, listen, I want a centre-back, I want a centre-back and they didn't back him and then lo and behold, the next summer they have Oli. They go and spend eighty-five million on Maguire. Like things aren't adding up. So for me, it just told me United are just a badly run club. The minute I saw they got rid of Jose, I said, "You lot don't know." I said, "Chelsea, I kind of understand because that's Roman's ethos. You ain't doing good enough. I don't care who you are, what you want. See you later." Like, and I respect it because guess what? It's proven its record. You look at Chelsea's record. So many different managers have been there, and so many have been successful. Why? Because each one that comes in, I'm going to back you. Show me what you can do. The minute you fall off, you're out the door. Conte, Ancelotti, uh, Scolari, I don't care what your status is. And I respect that. But at United, I felt like people were wanting to throw him under the bus and just say, he's finished, he's done. And I'm, I'm, I'm just so glad to see him almost having like a redemption season. Even if he doesn't win the Premier League, I think if he has us very close to the title towards the end of the season, I think he's earned a lot, a lot of credit. And then if he brings the silverware on top of that as well, give this man a statue somewhere in London <laughs> because he's a legend for two clubs now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I pray, no offence, I do pray he doesn't get your Premier League, but I'm not allowing to take up. I'm not allowing to take up. <laughs> I mean, it would, be, it would be interesting to have seen um, how Potts would have done if he had been backed. Mm. Because I always said that. I always said it will be one of the biggest ifs here. And my theory and my kind of Tottenham dream would be Jose does his thing. He does his little three-year project, as everybody says. He comes in, Premier League, Europa, League Cup, FA Cup. We do the full sweep. And then he just says, all right, see you later. I'm off. <laughs> Potch part two begins. As a Spurs fan, that would be my dream. And I hope, I hope in the meantime till then, Pochettino is very smart and goes to PSG where he can happily get himself some free medals so people can stop criticising him and saying he doesn't have any trophies or anything. Former club, former player, whatever, go and win yourself some easy Uber Eats titles and come back and live <laughs> the second part of Tottenham. Hey, the next 10 <laughs> years are safe, boys. <laughs> yeah, um, with my family, though, uh, all my dad's side, Chelsea fans, all my mum's side, actually Spurs fans. So you can imagine the the banter me and my my mum's dad, my uncle have have yeah. about Chelsea and Spurs. Well, um, I wanted to touch on the the rivalry that's kind of built up, I think, over these last 10, 15 years between Chelsea and Spurs, because there's not 
there isn't a reason why Chelsea particularly <laughs> hate you. Yeah. It's just it's just uh, it's just something you're brought up with. I don't know what, it is, what it is. I wanted to know what it is from a Spurs Spurs point of view. To be honest, for me, honestly. I didn't even know we had a Chelsea rivalry up until literally, as you said, about a decade ago. All of a yeah. sudden, I started seeing so many Chelsea fans hate Spurs. And I said, oh, well, you're in London. I guess we hate you as well. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> But personally, I don't have any real hatred towards West Ham fans, Palace fans. But because yeah. we're always competing kind of near each other around leagues, Chelsea and Arsenal, you just have a separate hatred for. Yeah. I think Chelsea definitely more over the more recent years because of the Battle of the Bridge, because yeah. of the more recent fixtures, whether it be us winning at the bridge or you guys coming winning at all, it's like the games are always edgy and on edge. And personally, I'm not mad at it. I actually quite enjoy these rivalries. And I'm like, I feel like the London derbies are the last few quality derbies that we can enjoy, in all honesty, that we were saying the game lacks passion. But I feel like in the North London derby, you still see a little bit of that. In the in the mm. Chelsea um, what, Spurs game, you still see a bit of that. Like the the Manchester derby the other day, oh, snooze fest. Oh. Honestly, I was like, I had my feet up. I was like, what is this? But <laughs> yeah. for me, the London derbies they still seem to have that something, and I don't know where it's come from. I don't know where, what the origins are of it, but I just assume it's two London teams. And I'm like, you know what? I'm all for it. Let's yeah. go. <laughs> it's, it's it's always it's always entertaining. And my dad always says the last thing I want to do is lose to Spurs. And like, yeah. it's just it's just how it is now. You know, I'll tell you what it is, yeah, honestly. I think from a Chelsea perspective, it's like Spurs are like the little brother. So if you had three siblings, you've got you've got Arsenal, who are the old boy, who are the oldest boy. They yeah. they, you know, won a few titles. But you came through as a second child, you were the better looking, the stronger, <laughs> you shown I'm the daddy now. And it's like the youngest now is stepping up a little bit. He's got a few hairs on his shit. He's going through puberty and he's like, you know what? <laughs> Let me challenge the two boys. And it's like, hold on, hold on. I've just beaten him up. I ain't got time for you just yet. So I think it just comes from a hate of like, ah, you lot are still little boys to us type of thing. So I think as as hopefully Spurs win something, we can maybe have a bit more say in that kind of derby. But for now, I think Chelsea fans can can hold the glory in that in that um, kind uh, of I, rivalry. I think, we, I think we can both agree though that it is nice to see Arsenal back down at the bottom of the table. <sighs> <laughs> Tremendous, <laughs> honestly. It's it's my favourite thing. It's like now it's more of a case of are they the worst club in London? Because Palace and Fulham Palace are above very them. close by. West, yeah, Ham are high above up. Them. West Ham are high up. So it's like Fulham, I'm just hoping, come on, lads, bring the team <laughs> together with, with Scott Parker being a former player and he's a manager there. And I'm like, Ooh. hey, please just do us this favour. I just need Arsenal to be the bottom place on oh, the right, club this season. Be... And it's rest in peace. I don't ever want to hear about no Invincibles. I don't want to hear about Wenger. All of this has now happened in black and white times. I don't remember this. <laughs> what have you done lately? And it's nothing but decline. Yeah. We've now seen, what is it, for almost four years of no Champions League football. And we always laughed at them for, you know, years of just getting top four, top four, top four. So Looking back at it, they were spoiled. <laughs> they were spoiled for too long. Wenger did an incredible job. And they threw their toys out of the pram. And this is karma for, to Arsenal fans. You had your greatest manager ever who built you up to even think you're this big and great club. And you threw him to the wayside, Wenger out and all this. You deserve to be where you are right now. And I love mm. it. They were the first fans to create a fan channel oh, and yeah. create abuse for their team. Listen, Arsenal have a lot of repenting to do, I'm telling you. This isn't <laughs> happening for any reason. When they won the Invincibles, they tried to go on like they were the greatest thing since sliced bread. And life has given them humility and said, no more <laughs> league titles for you, lads. And now it's 15th in the table. Listen, we can only sit back and enjoy this. we got, we got to enjoy this. Yeah, my, my best mate theory is also a Chelsea fan. Actually hates Arsenal pretty much just below Spurs. Like, it's, it's actually beautiful sometimes when you see clubs like that. Uh, one of my, uh, actually, one of our guys that's coming on for the Christmas special is an Arsenal fan. And uh, I'm sure after a few drinks, I may be bringing up how deep down the table they are. To his annoyance, nice. but you know. You must, you <laughs> must remind him every week. Just say, what you got to do is well, you not send him a screenshot of the bottom half of the table. Send him a screenshot of just the bottom five. <laughs> just to remind him, look, this is your battle here. This is, <laughs> don't focus above this. <laughs> oh, man. I might actually do that after this broadcast. It's, it's, it's annoying because he's a lovely bloke, but his team is just shocking. Yeah, I, reckon, remind him. I reckon I uh, reckon if Arteta loses tomorrow, 
I think he might be out. I think he's got two games. I think he's got two how games. Do, yeah, how long do you lot think Arteta's given now? Two games. I think I, if he loses think... the next one, he's got one more. And if he doesn't win well, that, that's it. Would he's... you say, and, and then would you say sacking him is the right decision then? Honestly, like, like, if, just speak as a neutral. I know you're a Chelsea I mean, fan. Mean, I think as a neutral. I'll right, spend. I'll spend then. <laughs> <laughs> ben, go on. Yeah. Uh, it, it looks like that he's already starting to lose the dressing room a little bit, and he's lost. He's lost seven games, mm-hmm. so already. So it, it, if you're saying he's got two more games, if he, he's, they'll be on nine losses if he lose both of them. But then when you look at it, like. Just the start of the season, it was like he'd steadied the ship. He'd gotten us defensively solid. He'd got the signing of Partey. He'd got the FA Cup. So it was like things were looking really positive and he was the Messiah and the second coming of Pep. So for me, I'm like, where did it all go wrong? When did it all become Arteta's problem? Because for me, as far as I'm aware, Arsenal still a badly run club. They still, I don't think, have fully backed him in the summer as well. Even though they got Partey, they kind of tried to haggle the whole summer and then in the deadline day they kind of had to force it so did they really back him I don't I'm not really sure so I don't know where Arsenal go from here if they sack him that's my thing I think Arsenal their best bet would be to actually maybe stick with him and say do you know what this crop of players have shown us year after year you're awful we're getting we're going to slowly do a clear out here and we're going to back this man and help him create the team in whatever identity he wants to. Because he's young, A, we knew that. And he's inexperienced. We knew that coming in as well. He then got us a cup, which is the respect you want or whatever. So now back him. I feel like if you give him January and results don't improve in the second half of the season, Arsenal should be grateful. This is what they're not realising. Should be grateful and a blessing in disguise if they don't qualify for the Europa League next year. Imagine next season now if Arteta clears the deadwood, so he's got a bit of finances now, gets backed in January and the summer. And when I say back, the squad is not going to be changed overnight, but you put one or two pieces in place where gradually the team improves. And then next season, it's a case of he only needs to focus on having a quality 11 because he's only going to be playing once a week. So Arsenal could low-key benefit so much from this if they really fully backed their manager and said, you know what? We're all behind him. We're going to clear the deadwood. We're going to back him. Let's see where we go under Arteta for the next two, three years. But I feel like the board or whatever, whoever is in charge is going to crumble to this fan base because they're so loud. As we said, AFTV's out there. You can't avoid the machine. And they're going to sack Arteta. And honestly, I don't know where Arsenal go from it. Big Sam is the only hope. (laughs) (laughs) He's the only one. It's It's a shame, really, because like you say... You, you would probably stick with him, but with the board the way they are and the fan base the way they are, it's likely they'll sack him. And um, it's it's unfortunate because it's like you say, it's not. But you know, like sometimes when you have to, I feel like sometimes you have to stand in the face of adversity. Sometimes mm. you know your fans are going to boo you and you just have to stick it out as a board because you know in the long run, you'll be right. And when you are right, you remind them, we stuck through the bad times. So the next time bad times come, stick with it through us because we went through it last time as well. Mm-hmm. But I feel like if you crumble every time at the first sign of like adversity or a rough patch, or I feel like you're just kind of almost doing this coward mentality and just taking the easy way out and, oh, let's restart again. Let's restart. Because now it'll be the third manager after Wenger. Oh, come on. It's it's it's, uh, it's it's an appalling state Arsenal. I'm happy. I'm enjoying it. I'm loving it. I'm eating popcorn every week. But yeah. like historically, what I grew up with, when I saw the O2, when I saw Henri, when I saw them winter gloves, when I saw Burkamp, Perez, even as a Spurs fan, I used to be like, maybe I chose the wrong club, you know, sometimes. But then I'm just like, no, 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 no. That's, that's, happy that's, now. Happy that's now. glory hunting. That's glory hunting. I always used to tell myself, that's glory hunting. We're not doing that. We're not doing that. Local club, local club. So. Listen, now now the, it's come full circle. Long run, you see? <laughs> <laughs> we shall see at the end of the season if it's, if it's the long run that you've been going down. Yeah. Hey, we will. We will. <laughs> well, um, yeah, with, with Arsenal's team, uh, I was on a stream last night in the comments, and they only have two top four players. Aubameyang on his day and Partey. The rest of the team, Lacazette maybe, but he's too flaky. You have a good game every so often. That's about it. Maitland-Niles and Saka. Maitland-Niles, they don't bloody play, ever. I don't know about that. 
And Saka is a future player, but not there yet. But the rest of their team, how the hell Jack is still playing for, for Arsenal? I'll never know. Mm. I'll never, ever, ever know. That has to be his last game. Has to be. He's, he's a farce, honestly. He's a It's fraud. shocking. But the he, rest he, of the he, team... He, he, He's made a career out of that World Cup or Euros, whatever tournament it was, he impressed for about four games. Mm-hmm. And he is this fake hard man who just gets sent off, doesn't do any good actual defending, doesn't have any defensive instincts, interceptions, nothing. And do you know what the funny thing is? I've been teasing Arsenal fans this season and saying that Hoiberg, who's come in at Tottenham this season Fantastic. for 15 million, is everything they wish Shaka was. Sure. That ball breaker, the passer, Everything he's got, they wish Shaka was. And now look at him, honestly. But sorry, go on. You were saying the rest of their squad. Yeah, no, the rest. I, was, I think Hoiberg has actually been one of the best signs you've made this season. I know you got bailed, but I mean, Hoiberg has changed your midfield. Massively, oh. massively. One of, one, of, one of the biggest components. And I, I was kind of one of the few that, at the beginning of the season, even a lot of Spurs fans weren't on board. They were like, oh, no, how are Arsenal bidding for Partey and we're bidding for Southampton players? And I was like, you guys have to stop looking at what clubs players are at. Look at Liverpool. They've got Van Dijk from Southampton. They got mm. Wijnaldum from Newcastle. They got Robertson from Hull. It's like, stop look, Appreciate the player for what he is. And I saw the profile of Hoiberg and I said, this guy didn't come through Bayern's academy for no reason. He, did, he wasn't, they didn't loan him out and think, do you know what? Maybe he can be a player for us. Southampton made him a captain after a year. I said, this guy's a leader. He's a proper personality and a character. And when it's you look at him player. on the pitch... Oh, that's what I said. I said, he is Jose on the pitch. Everything Jose's mentality is about, he can look at Hoiberg and say, that's me in a nutshell. And Hoiberg will give it everything. I'm telling you, give it about two, maybe two years, Hoiberg will be one of the vice captains at our club for sure. Fair enough. But yeah, anyway, back, back to the back to shocking back Arsenal. Back to the scum. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like they gave David Luiz a year extension on his contract. They signed William and given him ridiculous wages. Pepe's on the bench, worth signing almost for the last two seasons. Hopefully, have okay. a further don't follow in that trend. That's but... Kepa, actually. Yeah, I forget. Oh, that's it. Uh, oh, anyway. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was two seasons ago. It's fine. That was four seasons ago. It was just two seasons ago. I am worried about Havertz and Werner after today, but. Can we talk about, talk about Arsenal? Talk about Arsenal. I'm just going to say, you, you're naming all these players, but they, they, they were not good enough. But unfortunately, this is why it's, it's the sad thing that he's likely to get sets because at the, end, at the end of the day, the book will stop with the manager, which is Arteta. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it's, that's, it's just you the, hit the nail. You hit the nail on the head there. Like, that's what I feel like. I feel like Arteta, blaming Arteta on everything right now for me, I feel like is the easy way out. It's almost like the, the lashing out at the first thing you see, and it's Arteta. He's the guy who's got to take that. But I feel like even in the Ozil situation, he's taken a lot of flack for it. And I'm like, he hasn't made that decision. It's actually the board and above who've made that decision. So it's like he's even had his hand tied in your most expensive player and your most creative player. We're, we're going we're gonna to put him in the freezer. It's like, so Arsenal as a club for me have to take kind of accountability first before anything for me. Yeah. And it is it is quite enjoyable watching uh Chiefs oh, and stuff lovely. on for Arsenal fan TV just completely flipping out. <laughs> that clip yeah. where he, he I can't remember who he rips the mic off of. Oh, um one of the Barstool guys, Zar. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he just rips the mic off him having a screaming match and it's just like it's crazy. It's crazy. This this is this is why a lot of We've said it before. Is is Arsenal fan TV actually negative for Arsenal? I used to say no, because I just felt like it was it was an early pioneer in giving fans a perspective. I feel like it was definitely one of the main pushes of allowing people like us to even make podcasts and things like this and people caring and watching. And it's like, oh, hold on. People actually care about the fans' perspective as well and not just the pundits sat in Sky Sports Studio, because that's all we were used to. If you weren't sat in the Match of the Day studio, the Sky Sports studio, we didn't care what you had to say. But once you start, you're like, oh, these people have actually sometimes got better things to say. And they're actually funnier sometimes. So at first, I wasn't against it. But I feel like, especially over the last year or so, maybe, since the lockdown and COVID and kind of how they do the little chairs in front of the TV and you're just watching them kick chairs. I'm just like, at this point, you lot are just kind of playing a character and kind of 
just doing it for the views, I feel like, rather than being authentic, passionate fans that you were. And I get it nowadays, it's the content game, as people say sometimes, but it, there's there's a fine line, I feel like, and I always feel like you just want to keep your thoughts and your opinions kind of as authentic as possible, rather than becoming kind of a caricature of yourself or a kind of cartoonish version, because then I feel like people just kind of feel your opinion is diluted or won't take it as serious, and I, I, I'm kind of worried for AFTV that maybe that's where they're headed down, rather than becoming kind of this new wave, new big channel of they pioneered the fans and look what they've gone on to become. They could just become, oh, yeah, they've just become a bunch of jokers, basically, type of thing. And they're just a kind of, they host a bunch of clowns who just all laugh and joke and rip their club 24-7. It's like, let's have some different types of uh, content. Because I remember there was a point where they used to do things like tactical breakdowns and you had the AFTV club, which was like, you saw the behind the scenes of that. And I was like, my God, the way they're kind of coming at this from all angles, even Sky Sports couldn't do this. I was like, oh, so you've got to credit it. And the fact that it was all like self-funded, I was like, yeah. you really got to respect it. So regardless of that, they, they credit to their work. They've done incredible work. But there comes a point when you're toxic and it's just like, you can't lose that stigma once you get it, I feel like. And especially with how they act and how they kind of portray themselves, I feel like they almost lean into it too much. It's definitely so, to the detriment of the club, in my opinion. It's, it's do you think? Do you think the players are affected by it? Fan <laughs> opinions, which would then affect the players, could could but, be that yeah. factor. Do you reckon that? Like, I, like, the, I mean, like, do you think Bellerin will see the post-game troops ripping him and think to himself, "Shit, I better buck up next game." They can't. I mean, Surely they don't watch it. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. Even if they watch it, though, you've got to think, like, it's, as we've been saying, like, initially, yeah, I agree. Pioneers of the game, they are one of the main reasons me and Ben and you as well are, like, doing podcasts like this. But it's now at a point where if I was an Arsenal player, I put this on Xhaka, I would look at that and go, it's a bunch of guys who are just ridiculous. And... Yes, you may think in the back of your head, maybe if I just played a little bit better, they wouldn't be acting like this. But at the same time, they do it week in, week out. They are screaming down the mic, mm. kicking chairs, as you say. As a professional, I'm sure it's obviously not nice, but you can't completely take it into, a, into account. I mean, there's also, there's also the fact that like, they might be watching it and they'll just go, oh, yeah, but I earn 100k a week. <laughs> so, <laughs> and that's the thing. And that's the thing. It's like, for some people, money is everything. But I feel like money don't buy you happiness. No. Money can't buy you respect. Money can't buy you, like, love even. It's like people's real love. It's like you can't get that. So you can talk about your 100K and all this, but then people won't respect it. That's my thing. Mm -hmm. And you want your brand, you want your company, you want your team to be as respectable as possible. That's my thing at the end of the day. So my thing with them is I, I, I couldn't agree more. It's criticism 24-7. And for me, one thing I always say about criticism is – I'm all for it if, for example, like when we drew against West Ham, was it the crumbled in the last 10 minutes yeah. or three? I lost my shit in the post-game reaction. And I watch it back sometimes, it's cringe, and I'm just like, there was no need for that. Like, you could have definitely broken that. Like, my thing is, is I'm all for criticism sometimes. It's immediate post-game reactions, you get it. Mm. But give it some con constructive criticism sometimes as well. Like, when, it's, when you're talking about Arteta being a crap manager for the fifth video, now yeah. let me hear yeah. why you think he's a crap manager. What are the solutions you maybe think he could do? We mm. don't get that. You just get the same copy and paste formula almost, it seems like. And it's like, I feel like now people are starting to think it's almost like a formula. Oh, you just think you can kind of turn up, shout down the mic, kick a chair, and it's like, ha, ha, ha. Now we literally, uh, me personally, I use it as a laughing thing. I, look, I, look, I see Arsenal lose, and I'm like, let me go see AFTV just so I can laugh at their pain. Not, not so even so because it's like them good content. Yeah, not because it's like brilliant content or I'm thinking this is going to be an enjoyable watch or I'm going to get some insight from this. Nah, it's just let me laugh at their pain because I know they're about to do some dumb shit. Mm. So <laughs> that's 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 kind of what they've become, in my opinion, personally. But yeah, it's 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 how they've kind of portrayed themselves, I guess. I do, I do think there definitely is players, though, that like you say, money isn't everything, but I do think there's players that the money has... In a, in a sense, gone to the head. So they'll, they'll be like, 
oh, I'm getting like they, they they might they might be playing really badly. Not this is not about AFTV, but like just fan criticism in general. Oh, you meant the players earning 100k, is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought you meant the AFTV lot talking about. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> got the wrong end of the <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no. But no, I, I do think that there will be players who it's gone to that a bit and they'll be like, I'm not, I've, I'm earning 100k a week. Don't give a toss about what he says. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, and that, and, yeah, go on. It's, it's, it's just a, a wrong mentality to have, I think. So do you think then they should be invested and think, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna take in troops or DTs? No, criticism? no. I mean, because because for me, I think you, it's all taking it with a pinch of salt. In all honesty, I yeah. think you can kind of listen to it if you want to, but I don't think you feed into it really and truly. Like you should. I don't think any professional player should be sitting there, especially any Arsenal player after an <laughs> Arsenal game. Going, you know what? Let me check AFTV. Yeah. No, go and watch your own game give yourself yeah. a breakdown rather than letting anyone else kind of give yeah, you a breakdown. Yeah. So I, I hope players aren't. And if they are, for me personally, that would just be a sign of kind of weak mentality in all honesty. Yeah. That is not the kind of player I'd want at my club because I'm yeah. just like, you. I can't have you being affected by Twitter comments. And I get it if it's like persistent and obsessive and abusive or whatever, then I get it. But it's like when it's just kind of for like a bad game or whatever, like get over it. You've had yeah. a bad game take accountability for it, move on to the next step, like, just stay off social media for a day or two or whatever. It's like, yeah. we don't need to see what you were wearing before the game. We don't need to see <laughs> a sad picture of you saying we go again next week. Nobody cares. <laughs> go training tomorrow, do better next week. Yeah, uh, definitely. I wanted to take it back to your, uh, how you said that after you bottled it against West Ham, you had that fan reaction. It's sometimes yeah. great having that fan reaction, though, win or lose. Mm-hmm. But that's within, as we've said before, like within reason. Having that fan fan reaction, it's from the heart, and you're a you're a fan who has dedicated probably most of your life to yeah. a club. Yeah. So yeah. it's real when you do that. But it almost feels extenuated when Arsenal fan TV do it. But because, it's great because when you have got... other people doing oh. it like you. Hundred percent. But the thing is, it's like because you've got guys getting up in the middle of the filming asking, "Can I throw this chair around?" I'll pay anything I damage. And it's like, if you're that, you know, angry, just throw the damn chair. (laughs) If you're really that angry, just throw the damn chair. You ain't got to ask permission. Because that is telling me you want to do this as an act so it'll go viral or whatever. And it's like, Mm. and it's like, but whereas with, I always say with your like post-game reactions and things, keep it as authentic. Sometimes I'll see people who will see their team grind out an ugly 1-0 win and go on a rant angry just because, oh, we didn't play pretty football. And I'm like, mate, you want- you're, you're about to burst the vessel because you've got three <laughs> points. Like, mm. relax yourself. Sometimes look at the bigger picture. It's like, I feel like sometimes people are too reactionary. I always just say, just be authentic, man. Just mm. just go with the flow. Whatever you feel at that particular time, it's your opinion at the end of the day. Yeah. But if you're going to do something where you just feel like this is going to get views, this is going to go viral, this is going to get this type of reaction, I feel like that's when you kind of miss target what you're trying to do. And it gets diluted. Yeah, I've been uh, actually speaking. This reminds me of with a couple of United fans through Twitter and streams. And one of them said, like, they're in the top four, right? Yeah. If they get the United fans are complaining so much about how they're doing it. And Mm -hmm. it's kind of similar to, obviously, though, like the West Ham game I watched when United won 3 1. I was annoyed at United for how they played, but they still won 3 1. So why? Uh, it's hard to say. Like, how are United fans so, so, so angry with Oli? It goes, it goes back to that thing that I was saying with you lot. Where you're spoiled with success, City spoiled with success. Guess the one club who's the most spoiled? Yeah. Manchester United. The guys who were the first to get the treble. The guys who had Fergie for this many years. They almost feel like the genuine kings of England. So it's like for them to even go on this long of a drought, they're like. And you got to remember, a lot of these people, United fans on Twitter and all this complaining, they've been growing up maybe their whole life and just seeing armpits every season, armpits every season. And now reality has hit them. Football comes and swings around about us. You have peaks and lows. Nottingham Forest were doing Champions Leagues once upon a time. Now look at them. Yeah. So are Villa. Now look at them. It's like, it all changes. And I think that's what United fans need to grasp the reality of. And Arsenal fans as well. It's like, now is now. 
stop focusing on about what you did 10 years ago or 15 years ago and this is the club we used to be this is the Manchester way the Manchester way was winning guess what Fergie did you are not winning at the minute so if you're winning and getting results enjoy it if you're losing all right let's look, why did we lose because a lot of the times I just feel like fans just look for kind of any reason to kind of get angry and just throw a reaction and it's like oh come on like I, I'm, I'm very much a bigger picture kind of guy and I just feel like a lot of fans sometimes get lost in a moment and I mean football's the game that'll do that to you I'll be honest with you if there's any. Yeah. I did uh, watch the um, Gary Neville chatting about something not the fans specifically but chatting about why well, United he was like if you've been if they've been told at the start of the season you'll be above City uh, you'll be one win from being is it three or two or three points behind the top, mm-hmm. um, and what was the other one? You'll be in the quarters of the Carabao Cup or whatever. They would have probably taken that. Yeah. But he said, even it, watching on the pitch, something doesn't feel quite right. Which is so. And, and do you know what it is? I get it. It's the performances when you see it. Sometimes you just think this team looks a bit disjointed. But it's like, then at times, they've been like, similar to the West Ham game where you said, second half, they just came out and blitzed them. Was it Leipzig? Blitzed them. And I was like, United are capable. If they really put it together, they yeah. can do a madness. And and I, I was saying to Cam on our podcast, I was like, I see you lot as the dark horse next year. I was like, I think if you lot can add one or two pieces, which in Van der Beek and Cavani, you can say they did in Tellez. But if you lot can add the right one or two pieces, you can maybe kind of be a dark horse in this. But I don't know. With the way the Premier League is set up right now, I think it's don't anyone's. rule out anyone. It's anyone's race. It's like we're playing Liverpool tomorrow. We might go a few points clear. We might drop. But you never know what's going to happen week to week. So mm-hmm. I feel like this season more than ever, any team that can kind of string two or three results together, it's you jump up six places type of thing. Yeah. Chelsea were looked at like... The, star team of the season oh look at their signings Lamps is getting it together and slowly now they 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 United have got two games mm. so it's like how how bad is it really United could win those two games and be four points clear of Chelsea or, or three points clear of Chelsea it's like hold on let's not get too lost yeah. in the moment you know what I mean oh. even City City three weeks ago we on our podcast, we were having a bash fest, and I loved it. Because <laughs> <laughs> they were they were eleventh drawing to West Ham, and it was like the football's gone horrid, like the team's gone stale. It's KDB and hope for the best. And I said, Hold on, we need to actually sit down and discuss this. And then all of a sudden, two wins against Newcastle and Burnley, and it was boop, 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 mm. we're up to fourth or fifth, was it? Mm. And I was like, You don't know what's gonna happen this season, like, you never know. So as much as United fans and all them want to get lost in the moment. Yeah. I've it, been uh, kind of as a joint back in Villa this season <laughs> to get top four. That's, that's my Don't be prediction. surprised. <laughs> don't be surprised if they pip Chelsea in the last day. <laughs> no, don't say that. Don't say that. Imagine, imagine, imagine Chelsea fifth, imagine, Villa four. Imagine Barkley scoring the winning goal. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, no. don't, I don't want to imagine, mate. I don't want to imagine. <laughs> what were you about to say, Ben? I was just saying, I think the other thing with United, they, before the derby that was boring, they'd won four in the show. And then they had turned around. It was whether they were going to, they were going to be able to su- sustain that. Um, like, can you still hear me? Yeah, we can. We yeah. Can yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, whether they were able to su- sustain that. And it was the Champions League where it came up short because they, they, they nearly did it. Mm-hmm. I thought that I thought they were going to do it, uh, which I, I would have been fuming at. But um, but the thing yeah, is, thought, it's, I'll be honest with you. Even as a United fan, yeah, like every United fan is crying about that and thinking, "Oh, we're out the Champions League." Were United ever really going to win the Champions League? <laughs> so what does going out now, in, yeah. or going out in the quarterfinals, or going yeah. out in the first knockout round? Because guess what? Now the benefit you have, if top four tits up, I still got Europa. Mm. And guess what? I could win Europa, silverware. Like, yeah. there's there's nobody's ever looking at, like, the positive or the bigger picture. It's always just like, we're out of the Champions League. Oh, man, we could have gone through next round and been embarrassed by Bayern. I wish we did that. <laughs> yeah, Why? Yeah. <laughs> United were never going to win the Champions League. So, for me, anybody who's losing their shit and thinking, 
it's all over at United. Nah, bro. Trust me. Mm. I, I don't think so. I think United could be one to watch this year because if we've seen one thing, if they can string it together for half an hour even, they, they, they've got a dangerous attack. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, that's been an amazing tangent for the last hour. <laughs> but uh, Ben, we can't, uh, as I've spoken about the, the, the Chelsea game, we can't go over the City game against West Brom, mm. can we now? I didn't watch it, but you did. So do you want to give your analysis on it? I prefer not to speak. You're coming big trouble. Uh, no, um, story of our season. Uh, nah, um, that was last season, mate. Last season, yeah. <laughs> it, it, it was. It, it, we've got nothing in attack without Aguero. So, if I'm putting it simply, we've got nothing in attack without Aguero. So, we're not going to score more than like one or two goals in a match. This match is that was one, and then they got a goal that was a deflection. So. If you're not going to score more than one or two goals, I'm actually scuppered, which is what happened. Um, I mean, we had quite a few chances at the end. Uh, for some reason, like you say, goalkeepers are just having an absolute madness recently. Um, but I mean, we're I think we're two points behind you with a game in hand, so uh, that can't be bad. No, um, it can't be bad. Can't be bad. I can't believe Johnson looked incredible at the end of that game. I can't lie. He he actually got West Brom them points, I feel like. But with with Aguero, you just touched on that, yeah. He's now going into the last year of his contract. I would say maybe the whole of 2020, we've barely seen him. Mm. Is is this is this the beginning of the end? Well, they they Because you say you say you can't live without Aguero, but I'm I'm beginning to wonder is Pep kind of forcing Jesus this season even like the last couple of games he's been like I know Aguero's fit but I'm not playing him so it's like, I know yeah. there's the Maradona stuff going on and everything but I feel like he's really trying this season to back Jesus and I've always yeah. maintained Jesus is never going to feel them boots they're no. always too big for him Jesus is not Ferran Torres is a better striker than him um, <laughs> he's not even a striker um, yeah I mean in part, like you say, you've not seen him this year, which in part has been injuries. Um, and I think that they've sort of been not stalling on the contracts, but sort of seeing how how much is fit this season before they offer a new contract. Um, mm. But yeah, He's not passing the test. <laughs> like yeah, that. I mean, I mean, the last few games, like you say, against Marseille, he was fit but he was on the bench. Against United, apparently he had an illness. Uh, and then today he started on the bench. And I don't know, I, 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 I can't figure out whether it's him being like, I want to see it, save him so I have him for bringing back when he is proper, proper fit. So I have yeah. him for later in the season. Yeah. Or like I say, he's trying to persist with Jesus, which is never going to work. Yeah. So. It's a tough one for me, but... I don't know, with, with with City, it's a funny one because I feel like even the style of play you lot play now, it's just passing for passing's sake. Mm. Whereas I think I feel like in your Centurions and your formidable years, you lot were like, teams had the Vaseline ready before the game. Like, they knew what time it was. And now every team is kind of, they know they've got a chance against you because you in attack, you look toothless. And in defence, your defenders have always been kind of more focused on passing than defending you know honestly so it's a case of what has been the difference between that time and now because a lot of the players are still the same the manager's still the same yeah Torre company yeah not that so it, Torre, because you look at Torre yeah he was pretty much done when Pep came in and in his final year Pep basically just said yeah you can go and hand a bit it's the backroom effect like, I feel like and then I, I agree with that but then Company, I feel like as well, was kind of on his last legs. And you only, aside from the screamer, he really, I don't even think, mate, played more than 15 games that season. So yeah. it's like we never really got to see the, the two of them under Pep Reed and Trudy. But I don't know if that, those two solely can be, I, I think more maybe it could be a David Silva thing. But sorry, you, you were going to no, say. I, you were... I think so. I mean, especially this season, I think there's, there's many factors. And, and, and all teams affected, uh, have been affected by this who have been in Europe last season. So uh, 
there is also I'll get on to all the players and all that sort of stuff. Um, but the, there's the short preseason on the two weeks together. There's a mad schedule which is yeah. causing injuries, i.e. Aguero and people. Uh, there's us having no one, no one in attack because of that, and then also this is where it goes into the players. I, I do agree with that. That spine company, Silva, Torre, Aguero, company is gone. Torre gone. Silva gone. Aguero getting on a bit. So it's. I mean, we've start. We already started to sort of try and it, it, well, started to invest and sort of address that. So Ruben Diaz has looks quite good uh, up until now. Um, Perrin Torres has looked decent, but. That, like you say, um, Phil Foden. I think we he needs to play more. We we play better when he's in the team. I don't know why he doesn't play. He's a criminal. Know, he's a criminal pet for that. Yeah. For four years now, we've been teased with Foden. I've seen Saka. I've seen Greenwood. I've seen so many other youngsters break through since Jao Felix <laughs> has broke through, got a multi-million pound move, got called a flop. And revived his career in the time <laughs> Phil Foden has made his debut till now. And we're still being told, no, 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 no. Only on the weekend, dear. Yeah. Only on European games. Shut up. Start yeah. the kid for me. I don't know what more, especially when I look at that midfield and I see Rodri and Gundogan. Yeah. A Rodri, record signing and everything. Of course, big things are expected, but I'm starting to think he's maybe just Jorginho 2.0 in all yeah. honesty. Yeah. And with Gundogan, he uh, ever since I feel like he came to Man City and he had them injuries. I don't think he's ever really been the yeah. Dortmund player that you lot bought and wanted. And yeah. I feel like Foden's position there is prime. Silver was there last year, and Foden was meant to be the new yeah. Silver, and you just haven't seen that. And and I think what you touched on there is like that spine there, like both of you said, that is so important in the back dressing room. And you can't replace experience for me. Yeah. No matter how much quality you bring in, you can't replace experience. And I feel like Pep hasn't done a great job of that. I feel like he's tried to sign a lot of the players you lot currently have as well, as replacements. He has signed the Mares, the Rodri, the Gundawans, the um, who else? Mendy, like all these all these players who are meant to be the long term players. Um, Walker with Zabaleta. Walker's now I'm not gonna lie to you, Cancelo. You lot have a hell of a player there. One of the bet world's best fullbacks, I would say, right now, even. But I don't, I don't know what's gone wrong at City, in all honesty. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah I'll pause it oh, for yeah. you. Sorry, man. Um, yeah, uh, I was just going to say, like, with, with City, I don't know what is now yeah. going to be the new upswing for them. Like, what do you yeah. think has been like? What can give this team a, a new boost? Because Pep's now signed a new deal as well. Yeah. I thought that would have given everyone a lift, but it hasn't. I think, like, I think going back to like the struggles with the preseason schedule and stuff, and I think that like maybe fans as well. But the, I mean, I probably get accused of uh, being like, oh, just throw money at the problem and stuff. But yeah. like the the rumors of like us going in for Haaland and or oh, Lotaro Martinez from Inter. I think those are those are if we can get one of them because we like I said, we... Alan's already been in a Man City shirt as well. Yeah, no, no um, but is is it would it be almost uh, criminal for him to go to City with his links to United? Yeah, United, who he's only linked to United because Ollie. What do you mean? Uh, <laughs> and he's like, do you mean Haaland? Yeah. yeah. And, and, and he's, got more, he's got more links to City than United. I was gonna, his dad played there, yeah. he's wearing the kit as a junior. <laughs> and the fact that his fee comes down to 75 million in the summer, if City do not oh, make yeah. Haaland their number one priority, if most I, don't, I don't know. Like, forget, forget the next couple of years because that is for me the kind of talent mm. that can hold your front line down for the next 10 years. Easy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 19. Yeah. Or to get for the next 10 years, he could be the leading man in the Premier League. That that's scary. Haaland has it all pace, strength, aerial ability, like yeah. close control. Oh, the guy is unbelievable, honestly. For me, I think if yeah. City do not break the bank for that kid, that is, I agree there. That is definitely one signing I think that could bring the spark back. And it's like 
because right now I don't know about you, but I just feel like it's if KDB doesn't work or Sterling doesn't work, if those two aren't yeah. doing some kind of individual brilliance, it doesn't happen. Mm. Yeah, it's a it's a weird one as well because I with Pep signing that new contract, I felt at this season it felt like to me that it was his last season. It felt like it was winding down. And yeah. I was looking, I was looking ahead to thinking, oh, maybe Pochettino oh, or Nagelsmann yeah. or or Allegri or someone like that. Um, but now he's signed this two-year contract. It's always it's almost as if because he signed another two years, this season might be that transition season instead mm-hmm. for Pep. Yeah. I mean, we've spoken about it on the podcast before. This could be the kind of the transition period for City, which a lot of fans will get on top of because it's City okay. and be like, Oh, you suck, but it is a transition period for them. Yeah. No, that, that makes a lot of sense, to be honest. Because I, I, I think even if you look at their team, they, they've had investments, but I don't feel like over the last two, three years, it's been City-like investment, should we say. Mm-hmm. It's been the odd Mares here, a little Angelino there. Rodri, they broke the bank for, but I felt like that was a defensive midfielder and they were almost looking too long-term yeah. to trying to replace Fernandinho. Yeah, and I felt like uh, uh, Fernandinho wasn't even finished done yet. He he still <laughs> moved into centre back, and they still need him now. But I just feel like in in the key areas of the team, I feel like when Sane left, especially, that yeah. he is the kind of player when he came back off injury last year, I thought he could be a massive boost. But then to go off to Bayern like that, I felt like, hmm, I don't know what's going on there. Maybe not Pep's losing the dressing room. But the players are losing that motivation to want to play. Yeah, for I think it's but as you said, it could be a transition year, yeah. and and kind of the players are having to kind of adjust again. So yeah. I was I was I was disappointed when Sane left, but I think that was more because I don't think he likes that rotation. He wants to be playing week in week out. So if you, you're being rotated all the time, then he's he's like, but then he's going oh. to buy it and he's being playing every other week. Yeah, no, so, yeah. So it's not not works for what he wanted, but I mean he's still at Bayern. Um, but um, I think it's like you say, it's like it's, it's not been City like because the team was there, so it was like adding a, a player here and there, and it's not really addressing anything. It's only really this summer where when we got Ruben Diaz, where we actually addressed the problem. Yeah, 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 hundred percent, hundred percent, and that, and that just uh, sorry, carry on, carry on. You, no, you no, no, no. But But that Diaz there, I feel like that was the first time where I was like, oh, shit, City are actually addressing a problem. Like, they're not just garnishing the dinner. Like, they're now trying like, oh, no, we actually need to eat. It's like, we're we're, we're falling off here. Because that kind of gap last season to Liverpool, was it 20-odd? It was similar to, like, when United finished second. It was like, that team doesn't belong anywhere near that team. And you could clearly see that. But it was like, the previous two years before that, they were neck and neck. And the yeah. squad really weren't that much different. But you see it over time, and we saw it at Spurs as well. No matter how good the players are, whether it be Toby, all of our old Vertonghen, Lloris, Walker, Rose, things get stale, no matter how good they get. Yeah. You have to freshen things up. And that's one thing I always credit Fergie back in the day for. No matter how many titles he was winning, I'm going to throw in a Cristiano Ronaldo. And guess what? I might throw out a Van Nistelrooy early because... I can already see the potential in Rooney and Ronaldo. Like, Fergie would take those kind of gambles just to keep it freshened up. Whereas I feel like now, once teams have their philosophies, they're set, they're starting 11, it's like, all right, I'm just going to stick to this. This has been working for me, and I'm not going to stop till it goes stale. And teams, or now transition year is almost like a normal thing, if that makes sense. Like, when when before 2010 did we ever hear a transition year? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like you had one maybe every decade or every twenty years, but I guess maybe the money's changed the game. But... Yeah, yeah. I mean, I remember um, sort of. I'm hoping that next summer we have a transfer window that was like Pep's second season when we uh, uh, were Centurions, because he that's when we got Walker, Bernardo Silva, Edison. Uh, I can't remember the rest, but uh, yeah, many no, people. That- Thinking. Yeah, I remember that. You addressed a lot of problems. You addressed your fullbacks. You addressed the goalkeeper. You addressed the midfield. You addressed the wide areas. Like you were actually, I remember the first year was almost like experimental year for Pep to see who yeah. was going to step up and who was going to be shipped out. And guys like Kolarov and Sanya, they got thrown to the <laughs> wayside. And it was like Zabaleta, I right, you can stay one more year or whatever. Yeah. But 
I feel like that might be what needs to happen now. Like I look at players like Mares and I know he's won that Leicester title and he had that brilliant year, but if City want to be Champions League winners and Premier League winners, Mares isn't going to be the winger at 30 or 31 that's going to be that guy. You, you've got to replace that side. Yeah. Then I look at Jesus. I'm like, that's not going to be a striker that guarantees me 30 goals a year. You need to replace that. I look at Sterling, KDB, I'm confident. Foden, you can break him through. But then it's like you're going to put a lot into a youngster. I would maybe sign another quality ball playing midfielder who I know can chip in with a few goals or assist here and there. Mm. I think defence, I actually think you're probably the most sound in the league. <laughs> I actually <laughs> think it's the one area you don't have to worry. I think you've got Edison who, despite one or two lapse moments, his distribution is the best in the world. The guy should be on set pieces, I think. He needs to do something. <laughs> Needs to learn to take free kicks because that foot is amazing. And I think your centre-back pairing, personally, I, uh, the boys killed me on my podcast, but I went out on a ledge and even said, I think that potentially could be the best centre-back pairing for the next maybe four or five years, I think. I think Over you, Gomez and Van uh, For me, uh, Gomez, I don't really rate in all honesty. I think Van Dijk is so good, he raises mm-hmm. Gomez's level. Whereas mm-hmm. I look at Laporte and Diaz and I'm like, you two are both very quality. Of course, Laporte has been around a little long, so we respect him more. But right now, Diaz is looking amazing and Laporte's watching from the sidelines. So it's like, yeah. listen, I think if Pep can somehow, some way make those two click, it's amazing. But I think, as I said earlier, Cancelo, an amazing one. Carl Walker, rejuvenation season. Mendy, I don't know. What's going on with that hairstyle? <laughs> well, I saw that today. I had to check who it was. <laughs> he's one that I think, like, I'm happy for Cancelo because he's taking that position off him because Mendy, I felt like, wasn't taking his chances. Whether that be through injuries, of course, denying him, but even when he played last year a lot, I don't think he really took the opportunity to make that left-back spot his own. And I look at his age, his injury record, I'm thinking, do you know what? I might still sign a quality left-back. I know left-back's been an issue during the whole Pep's entire era. He's played Zinchenko. He's played all <laughs> types, Fabian Delph. And, but yeah. I think for once, just go out sign a quality left back, move Cancelo to right back because Carl Walker's agent, despite the rejuvenation season, do what Fergie does. Replace a player before he expires. Don't yeah. wait till Ivanovic, what happened? He falls off and then you try and replace him. Zabaleta, you fall off, you try and replace him. Sometimes people always try and wait till the player's completely gone to replace him. And I feel like City this summer need to just say, you know what? Yeah. People always tease us about spending the bank. Say no more. This year we're going to spend <laughs> 400 million and I feel like you guys might have even missed a trick this year because the FFP rules were relaxed oh yeah mm. this because was the year in any year but instead everybody wanted to play the COVID card and say now nah, we're frugal we're frugal because if you were seen as the big spenders in COVID clubs are going to charge you the, the absolute maximum premium <laughs> like you saw what happened to Chelsea getting charged 50 million 120 million for all these kind of like middle of the road players I would say or players that I don't think are at that level to request that fee like yeah. you're not paying 50 million for Chilwell you better be telling me he's going to be one of the bet world's best left backs when you're paying 120 mil for Kai Havertz he better become a generational talent so <laughs> it, that's what I'm saying with these fees it gets crazy yeah yeah that's, fingers crossed <laughs> <laughs> alright well uh, often kind of at the end of these podcasts we do ask some more questions about yourself so that listeners and viewers can actually get to know you that they may not be able to get from anything else that you do so i'll start with kind of we start with maybe a football football more questions then we'll go on to more about your youtube history um what was your first spurs game do you remember it uh when, have you been to been to many yeah uh, to be honest it was quite a few years ago it were, like i didn't i don't think i even went to a spurs game until i was about 20 odd because, uh, well, to be honest, just growing up, we just couldn't afford it. <laughs> I was like, yeah. so, you know, it is what it is. I'll, I'll, I'll get there when I get there. But I think it was a preseason game where we played Schalke. And I think it was uh, Eric Dyer making his debut, I think it was. Or was it maybe two years? But it was around 20, 2014, 2015 anyway. But yeah, preseason friendly. I remember we'd won 2 nil, And for me, it dawned on me then very early on that like when you go to live games you very seldomly remember the game sometimes. I feel like sometimes you remember the game, sometimes you don't. And a lot of the live games I've went to, it's like the atmosphere. You tend to focus on different things around going on. And it's like, 
the game, you almost think, oh, shit, yeah, there's a game to watch as well. Shit, yeah. <laughs> so I, I love going to games, but I, I probably don't get to them as often as I should. And now with COVID and lockdown, more yeah, than yeah. I feel like in the last maybe two years, I've been to more than any. Two, three years, but who knows when we'll get back to that, man. I miss that. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, so what, what would you say your favourite Spurs game that you've been to watch is then? I'd probably say... The Inter Milan one, to be honest, Champions League group stage one, the final game at Wembley. It was kind of like the year where we went on the Champions League final run as well. So I felt like I got to witness a bit of that. <laughs> that game was one. The fact that it was the last group game at Wembley, there was a lot of kind of, you know, this is a big night and we got the result in the end. So I was happy with that. Cool. What's, the, what's your kind of earliest memory of Spurs then? You've spoken about going to a game. What's your most earliest memory? Oh. I mean, how I even became a Spurs fan was kind of funny because I was born in Holland and then we came over here in 1997. So then, I mean, I think maybe the first two years I was in the country, I didn't really support any team. I was just like, nope, Ajax is my team back home. I'm sticking with Ajax type of thing. And everyone just used to be like, no, you have to pick between United or Arsenal because they were the two <laughs> at the time. Yeah. And I was just like, nope, you're not going to force me. And I remember I glory hunted for one year, which was the treble year. I remember I supported, I cheered it on, and I just said, this don't feel right. And Tottenham was obviously where, where we grew up, and that was kind of like the local team. And I remember just seeing when Martin Yol had arrived, I would say I officially was like, I'm all in on this. And it was like Martin Yol, Edgar Davids, those kind of early inspirations, seeing Spurs be the outside pretenders and the little club that's trying to break this barrier top four, I was like, these are the guys I think I like them. I, I like this underdog story almost. That's what it was for me. It wasn't like, I didn't want the big success and big story. I was like, that's what, I want a team with character. The team that has one or two nice little players. Oh, we got, we're, we're going to sign Jermaine Defoe of West Ham. Oh, that's nice. Robbie Keane does the little cartwheels with the, yeah, I like this team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's kind of what kind of pulled me in there early on. But yeah, Martin Yo era kind of, I did have a little flirt with Newcastle just before that as well. <laughs> but Tottenham, once once I was there, it was like, that's it. I'm all in. Cool. Uh, what's your favourite Spurs goal that you've seen? I'm not even going to lie. It's got to be the Gareth Bale into Milan. Right. For me, it was like, you saw the moment the boy became a man almost. And mm. you saw one of the world's greatest right backs at that time in Mycon get absolutely ripped to shreds by a kid who's skinny, scrawny and speedy was told he's a left back. And the first 25 games he played for the club, we hadn't won. So he was seen as almost like a jinx. And then finally Harry Redknapp had said, you know what, well, this half, I'm going to play you in left midfield. And that was the result. And ever since then, the rest is history. I mean, we're talking... 100 mil move, the, the crazy goals he was scoring for Spurs. But I mean, that 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 for me, it would be one of the most memorable goals, I think, where I was just like, wow, this is this is a moment right here. But the Peter Crouch goal as well, I remember, against City. Big, big goal. Because that was like, you know, Champions League football secured for the first time in God knows how long. So, yeah, some a couple big goals. A couple big goals there, yeah. Mm. Fair enough. Well, uh, I know you're part of a, a group channel, but so I thought it'd still be good to get kind of your views on your YouTube career. Mm -hmm. What kind of event or person inspired you to get into, into YouTube? It's weird, but America, I, I watched like a lot of American content and I remember seeing um, like companies like Barstool and guys like um, mm -hmm. Charlemagne the God and they were always kind of doing like their own independent things. So Charlemagne might do his daily show on the breakfast club or whatever, which everybody loves and goes to watch, but then he'd have his own little podcast on the side. And I said, I listen, I used to listen to that podcast religiously from like 2014 onwards. And I was like, this podcast stuff is very interesting. It's just like you have your own basically custom radio station. You go on there, you can go on with your mates. You talk for however long you want. You go out and people enjoy it. All right, one day, maybe one day, maybe I'll get into it. So then when my friend kind of started 360 and he'd already kind of started as like a blog page and started, got the ball rolling, 
he wanted to create some original content. And that's when it was like, oh, I'd been seeing all the stuff like Barstool, how they grow their brand and company and things like that. And I'd seen like Charlemagne the God with his podcast and Joe Rogan as well was another one at the time as well who I was watching. And Joe yeah. Rogan was a fascinating one as well because he gets so many different types Rogan, of characters. Yeah. And you're just like, I didn't even like mountain climbing, but this dude just made me listen to three hours of a mountain climbing podcast. It's like, it's like hmm. how did I get sucked into this? And this is what podcast was. I was like, there's all these weird different types of personalities and things that you just might listen to because you're bored at work and you're like, you know what? It's an easy listen. So I said, all right, maybe we could do the football thing because we sit around here every day talking football for about three hours or four hours or whatever. So we could start the podcast or whatever. So he came up with the idea, held auditions for it, got all us boys together. And then once it was kind of like the team was formed, it was just a building process, basically just week by week, kind of hashing it out, hashing it out. But it's, yeah, it's, it's just, a, it's just a building thing to be honest. And, but inspiration, I would say that those, those would be the main ones for me. I'd say like Charlemagne, Joe Rogan. Yeah. Th- th- those are the two kind of spearheaded and Andrew Schultz as well, who he does the podcast with. He was another one who I saw kind of like spin off what Charlemagne did and made his own podcast off the back of, that podcast and i was like oh it's weird like you can be the co-host of a podcast and then have your own podcast. it's like it's a fascinating world so yeah i'm here now <laughs> <laughs> cool um so is this sort of your, your the first time that you've had a youtube channel or have you had previous yeah. ones yeah no this is this is the first time to be honest and it's like even now i don't really even fully run it it's like we just mm. upload kind of like the the podcast and things we don't really gauge too much on the metrics and things like that it's like we see the comments and that's it and it's like all right cool we'll keep it moving type of thing but yeah yeah first time i'd say i, I was actually gonna ask you who is your favorite um wait, what was this? I lost that. what was your favorite thing to do about youtube just general watching to be honest like, <laughs> i'm not even joking with you i probably watch more youtube than actual tv like i only use tv to watch live football Aside from that, and now that uh, BT and all that are on my PlayStation, I don't even use the TV really and truly aside for that. Do you see what I'm saying? So mm. for me, it's just enjoyment at the end of the day. It's it's similar to like I was saying with the podcast. It's the freedom to do whatever you want, how you want at the end of the day. And it's all when you want it as well. So it's like, I can do a podcast today. I can do it tomorrow. We can do it next week. And I might drop it tomorrow. might drop it a week after. So like it's all at like your own pace type of thing. So that's the thing I love about it, to be honest, is it's freedom to do anything at your own will. Do you know what I mean? And then people organically kind of enjoy it. Mm. Yeah. Um, so is is there anything that you would, looking back, is there anything that you would do differently with the channel? Or um, maybe promo it a little bit better. I don't know how, mm. but <laughs> yeah, just try and maybe help promo it a bit better. Yeah, I think I think we can we can relate to that. Definitely can relate to that. <laughs> I still haven't figured that one out to be honest. Um, We've only just started trying to use Twitter, so you know it's it's. <laughs> I think that's definitely one avenue. I think um, like having your own personal accounts, having the socials on kind of Instagram and Twitter. I would say maybe use Instagram to drop snippets of the kind of that's what we use to drive that. Twitter will drive kind of if you want to say more clickbaity clips, because we know things can kind of get sent around real quickly just through a retweet on Twitter. So with Twitter, that's one thing I find it's getting your content to be pushed is a lot easier because all people do is tap a button. It's reshare. Whereas on things like Instagram and YouTube, you've got to sit through a whole hour or whatever. Instagram is like, you only get a minute video and then you've got to double tap it or you've got to put it on your story. I just find Twitter is probably the easiest place to help grow your kind of brand or kind of podcast or anything cheers well yeah definitely think about that uh what is your future goals with the channel and your kind of youtube career uh ideally just you know honestly independency uh, is is for me personally what it is it's the ability to do what i love which is talk about football talk about life and things like that but mainly football, in all honesty. Like, we, our thing is, is to come in and give football and sports media a different flavour, 
a different perspective, a different outlook. And we feel like we've kind of made small hedgeways into that. And we just kind of want to be one of the main, similar to like how AFTV were pioneers of kind of like a new phase of media. We mm. kind of want to be that for like blogs and kind of YouTubers and podcasters and things like that. Like there's not, there's the, now there's more and more kind of football podcasts and everything, but it's like, we really, really want to be like one of the, almost household names if you want to call it in sports mm. media. 360 tv to just be oh yeah it's like barstool or it's like you know how in america you have espn nbc 50 different channels nobody has a problem with it everybody watches all of them as well but it seems like in england we're only allowed to have sky sports and that's it like we had satanta for about two weeks and then they scrapped that like <laughs> every time there's like a right bt i don't know how they've survived this long they've got some crazy money back in i think but mm. I just like to see different perspectives and I feel like that's what this has given us. And that's what we want to bring is a different authentic perspective. And if we can do that by being ourselves and getting to the top that way, even better. Cool. Just uh, one last, one last question. If there's uh, any player from a city or Chelsea that you could have at Spurs, who would it be? There's only one baby. The best player in the league, the best player in Europe, Kevin De Bruyne. <laughs> the only one. That title for the best player in the Premier League, just know we're coming for it. My boy <laughs> Harry Kane has put everybody on notice this season. Yeah. <laughs> son as well. Son as well. Hey, son is son is there as well. Don't sleep on him. Trust me. Yeah. That's, uh, I think that's a fantastic <laughs> way to, uh, to leave the podcast. There. Uh, is there anything else you want to uh, talk about, Ben? Um. No, it's fine, yeah. Well, for while, it's been a pleasure. Uh, fantastic chat. I mean, I think we were going to go more down the Spurs route, but it's been fantastic chat talking yeah. about general football. Yeah. I think we could have spoken for hours, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> Even though it is now 20 to 12 on a Tuesday night. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah uh, thanks for coming on. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. No worries. appreciate you having me on, man. It's been good. It's been good, definitely. Uh, for our viewers, like and subscribe if you're new around here. Trying to hit 750 by the end of the year, but it's looking more like 700 now. So that's that's our goal, I think. 700 before the end of the year would be ideal. We're only 27 subscribers away, so fingers crossed. That would be a nice goal, considering months ago we were saying 500 by the end of the year, and now we're saying 700, which is... Thing, it, it's, it, and the weird thing you'll realise is it will be a snowball effect, I'm telling you. Once you get to the 1,000, it's like, all right, now I want 1,500, now 2,000. But it's like, the more you keep growing, the quicker it will keep growing as well, trust me. Oh, cheers man cheers man so uh, yeah check out Fuad and the channel uh, down below link will be there for sure and yeah uh, see you guys on Sunday for the podcast and then we've got our Christmas special after that so please do check that out it's going to be a special one <laughs> alright we'll see you guys later thank you for watching